ang Peninsula Malaysia. To you, Ellen. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear okay. you. Okay. Uh, let us pray. Gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for the another beautiful day you've given to us. Thank you, Lord, for giving us this opportunity to join this webinar session um, that every one of us can learn and gain many insights, Lord, from uh, this meeting. May you especially be with the speakers today, Lord, as they present their um, topics, that you will guide them. We will help them to be able to share exactly what they want to share to each and every one of us. And may each one of us be blessed by uh, our learning today, Lord, that we, what we learn, we will be able to do, not just hear, but be doers also. And um, be able to uh, get every church members involved in um, the outreach ministry and so forth. Thank you, Father, for um, hearing and answering our prayers. And most of all, I pray that our session will go smoothly without any hiccups. I surrender everything to your loving hands. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Yeah, good morning again, everyone. Can you hear me? Thank you. Um, I have not met personally our speaker this morning, our first speaker, but um, uh, I would like to say to you a little bit about him. Uh, Dr. Torben Berglen is one of the associate directors of the Health Ministries Department of the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists, the global headquarters of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. He is originally from Norway and comes from a pastoral family. As a lay member, of, as a lay member he has served as a youth leader, Sabbath school leader, and he is an ordained elder in uh, local churches. Dr. Berglund holds his uh, medical uh, doctor from uh, Cop Copenhagen uh, University, Denmark. He did his residency in uh, psychiatrist at the modern, uh, uh, at the modern bed clinic Oslo University Hospital and Vestry Pekken uh, Hospitals, Norway. He trained as a psychotherapist at the Institute for Psychotherapy, Oslo, Norway. Um, <clears throat> as a psychiatrist and a psychotherapist, he has taken a special interest in working with patients with depression, anxiety, and personality disorders, as well as integrating relation, relational religious and existential perspective in psychotherapy. He served as chair of the depression department of Mudum Bed. Bickensen, Norway, an esteemed private hospital run by our Christian foundation that specializes in psychotherapeutic treatment and research. In 2015, he accepted the call as health ministry's director of the trans-European uh, yeah, European division based in St. Albans, England. In 2018, 
he transferred to the General Conference as Associate Director with a special focus on mental health and the health and well-being of his workers. He considers it to be a great privilege to serve God through gifts he has been given. A little bit more about our speaker this morning. He enjoys and prioritize uh, spending time with friends and family. He is a cyclist, a runner, a skier, and has nine mountains, which is above 4,000 meters high in the Alps. Among them is Mount Blanc, which is the highest mountain in Western Europe. Dr. Berglen, we are happy to have you this morning. And uh, without further ado, I give you the time now. Thank you. Yes, th thank you very much. Uh, and I'm happy to be with you. Uh, for you, it's morning. For me, it's already dark outside. It's still Tuesday evening uh, in my place. Uh, so, but this is what technology allows us to do. Um, I was just thinking and reflecting. I, last year, the last year, I've actually been to your division three times. Two times to Indonesia and one time to the Philippines. And I enjoyed it very much. And I think actually that your division is the division I visited the most times last year. <laughs> so I'm, I'm happy that uh, uh, you have invited me also again. I, when I was there in February in the Philippines, I wasn't expecting to be back for a conference already in June. But uh, these are some of the uh, opportunities that this whole situation with the COVID has uh, given given us. Um, so uh, this this morning, uh, I am going to focus uh, on more the mental health aspect of of this pandemic, uh, and I'm going to use a PowerPoint uh, and um, hope everything will work well. Um, so you can follow along on, on, on the screen. Um, so the title is How to Care for Your Emotional and Mental Well-Being During COVID-19. Um, and then you may say, well, is, is our emotional and mental well-being a problem? Isn't this a virus that infects the lungs and the respiratory system? Um, and I would sort of just ask you sort of start with a trick question. COVID-19, is it just a respiratory illness? Um, like, unfortunately, we, we're not together, so I can't see you and I can't hear what you say. Uh, but of course, this is a trick question uh, that I've given you. Uh, I would say it's not just a respiratory illness. Uh, COVID-19 is a biopsychosocial spiritual illness. And when we're dealing with this issue, we need to focus on all these dimensions, both as we care for ourselves and as we care for others. This whole situation will affect all the dimensions of who we are, uh, how we relate to one another, how we do physically, how we do mentally, how we do socially, how we do spiritually. Um, and from an Adventist perspective, uh, like every illness is a biopsychosocial spiritual illness. That is the holistic perspective uh, that we have and that we always need to pay attention to uh, when we're trying to help people and as we're trying to develop uh, our own health and, and well being. So I'm not going to talk much about the bio part of COVID-19. Uh, I'm not an expert on that. I'm a psychiatrist. Um, so even though I am a medical doctor, it's been many years since I've been treating people for their physical illnesses. Uh, so this is not my expertise, but I want to share on these other dimensions, the psychological, the social and the spiritual and how we need all these 
uh, aspect and to be mindful of them as we deal with it. Um, uh, about a month ago, the United Nations, they published a report on COVID-19 and the need for action on mental health. The United Nations, they are really concerned about how is this pandemic going to affect us on a mental level. Um, and sort of this is not just the World Health Organization, this is was reached like the highest level of the United Nations. The Secretary General was the one who presented this report. Uh, and we need to be uh, focused on this and, and mindful of this. And I just want to quote from, from this report initially. Um, brief from, this is from the introduction. Uh, the reference is, is below and you can Google it and you can find it. It's very sobering read uh, and to understand what is the world facing, what are people facing of challenges in the mental health area uh, now and into the future. So what they, United Nations, they summarize it um, here. They say psychological distress in populations is widespread. And this is all over the world. All over the world, this is the case. Many people are distressed due to the immediate health impact of the virus uh, and the consequences of physical isolation. Many are afraid of infection, dying and losing family members. That's a major stress that many people are facing. And beyond that, individuals have been physically distanced from loved ones and peers. And we are not created to live in isolation. As human beings, we are created from the very beginning to be together with other people. And this is a big challenge uh, and it's not natural for us to be isolated as many people have been. And then beyond that, millions of people are facing economic turmoil having lost of being at risk of losing their income and livelihoods, major financial challenges and problems that many people are facing, which again is a major stress. Then another big problem, which I've been is frequent misinformation and rumors about the virus and deep uncertainty about the future are common sources of distress. I'll, and then sort of they summarize this, what, what are the implications of this? United Nations, they say a long-term upsurge in the number and severity of mental health problems is likely. So we'll see more people having mental health problems, also people who haven't had it before, uh, and the severity people are going to struggle more. And those are the reports we hear all around. Uh, the Lancet Journal, uh, the Psychiatry Day in April, they had this article. And they said the pandemic will cause distress and leave many people vulnerable to mental health problems and suicidal behavior. So that's the severity of what we are dealing with is that people will struggle so much that also people will have suicidal thoughts and people will uh, attempt suicides also because of that. And they say mental health consequences are likely to be present for longer and peak later than the actual pandemic. Uh, so even like we don't know when this pandemic is going to be over. Um, it seems like it's going to stay with us for a while. Uh, and with that, all the mental health challenges that people uh, are dealing with, that's also going to be a major issue in, in the time ahead. I'd like to quote uh, Ellen White, one of the founders of the Adventist Church, um, and she says, and I think this is a very realistic perspective um, of, of what is life like. This was written in 1905, that's more than 100 years ago, but it's still true today. We live, we are in a world of suffering. That is the reality of the world we're living in. Difficulty, trial and sorrow await all of us along the way to our heavenly home. Being a Christian, being an Adventist, 
does not mean that we won't be suffering. That won't mean doesn't mean that we won't have difficulties, trials, sorrows. It doesn't mean that we are protected from the pandemic and the implications of the pandemic. So this is the reality that we have to acknowledge and live with and deal with uh, in now and into into the future. The only way that we can survive in this world is when we have physical, mental, social, and spiritual resilience. We need all these resilience in all these dimensions of life if we're going to survive. If, like, if our immune system would fail, then the reality of the world we live in is that in a few hours we would be dead because there are so many threats surrounding us all the time. And that is our resilience. Our immune system is one of the resilience factors we have on a physical level. But in the same way, we need our immune systems to be optimized also on the mental, social and spiritual levels of, of life. Uh, and I'm not talking like about the biological immune system, but, but are the mechanisms we have to cope with the challenges, the problems that, that, that face us. Resilience, uh, I assume many of you may know the term well, but it is a very important term when we're dealing with health. Um, and in general, what it comes, it applies not only to health, but anything that is able to like that deforms when it's pressure, stress is applied on it, but then it's able to bounce back. That is resilience. And when we talk about it on a psychological, mental level, emotional level, it is the ability to recover and adjust when we are faced with difficult things so that we don't just collapse, that we don't just give up, but that we keep going, we move forward, uh, we bounce back. That's very important to, to, to be able to do that. A good sort of example of an object that is resilient is a, a tennis ball or basically any ball that bounces. The, the property of a ball is that when you hit it, kick it, or whatever you do, then it deforms, but then it bounces back. And that's why it works. That's why we can have fun. That's why we can play with it. And the thing is when we're dealing with this crisis uh, that we're in the midst of all, we will be impacted, all of us. We will be maybe in some areas of life will be impacted, will experience some kind of deformation and the question is, how can we manage this uh, so we can be able to bounce back? And um, I want to show you uh, a short video, and I hope it works uh, and that you can see it uh, and at least hear the audio. Uh, I wrote the script for this, and it was uh, made by an Adventist uh, magazine called uh, Compass. And it, it's, it's on YouTube uh, if you want to look it up. Uh, in this, this, I have sort of given some uh, advice, things that, that are crucial things that we need, attitudes we need to have, ways we need to think, how we need to deal with our emotions as we face this, this, this challenge. So I'll, I'll play it now. A crisis is not a nightmare we wake up from. It's a reality we wake up to. It reminds us that we never know what the next moment will bring. It reminds us that we are fragile beings. It represents a threat to someone or something important to us, maybe even to our very existence. A crisis triggers anxiety, pain, and distress. And feelings in difficult times, so we can get through and maybe even come out on the other side stronger. Here are five ways. Number one, it's a crisis. Face it. Let it be what it is, not more, not less, according to the limits of our knowledge and understanding. 
If you maximize it, you will worry needlessly. If you minimize it, you will not do what is needed. There's no turning back nor running away. A crisis is one step at a time on an unknown path into an unknown future. Number two, it is difficult, accept it. Many will suffer physically, mentally, relationally, socially, financially, existentially, and spiritually. There is no point in trying to persuade yourself and others that all is well. It is not. Be honest, be real, be true. A crisis brings out the best and the worst in us. Therefore, be patient, kind, and compassionate with others and with yourself. Number three, what you do makes a difference. Be intentional about it. Stay connected with God and with people you care about. Maybe it's time for some of those deeper conversations. Take care of yourself and what is around you. The outside impacts how you feel on the inside. Move daily for at least 30 minutes. Enjoy the sun. It not only brightens the sky, it also brightens the mind. Dust off those cookbooks and try out some new recipes. Eat plenty of fresh vegetables, fruits, and other whole foods. Go to bed early to wake up refreshed in the morning. Laugh frequently. Humor is a good way to buffer pain and release tension. Cry when needed. Crying is also a good way to release tension and to communicate to others that you are suffering. Take care of others. It will help you keep things in perspective and give you a pause from your own worries and troubles. Number four, it's time for reflection. Enter into it. We live in a world so rushed that each waking moment may be filled with something. This leaves little time to think, to reflect, to feel, to talk, and to connect. Allow spaces of time to open up. Don't stuff time with whatever is at hand. Allow reflection to enter. Am I living the life I want to live? What are the real values and priorities of my life? Put first things first. Is it work? Is it money? Is it health? Is it friends? Is it family? Is it God? Number five, there is hope. Embrace it. As long as there is life, there is hope. And for Christians, even death is not the end. Trust that God works for the good of those who love him. Finally, as the Apostle Paul says in the Bible, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guide your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. I hope you were able to hear and see and see that it, it's a big challenge with this technology, uh, and it can. But I hope it works. It you can if you wasn't able to see it, you can find it on 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 YouTube. Uh, also, this is based on an article that I, I wrote and was published in the Advocates World. Uh, so struggling with isolation during the pandemic. If, if we want to reread re, re it. Uh, what, what I think is essential in this and what I want to communicate with this is that we have to, if we're going to cope well with a crisis, we have to acknowledge that it is a crisis. And in a crisis, uh, we experience a lot of stress uh, and we have to acknowledge that uh, there's no way that we can just run away from it. We can't wish it was different. This is our reality that we are dealing or that we are in and we must deal with it as reality he is uh, but what i hope also and i think this is one of the like i'm not saying that there's a that this pandemic crisis is a good thing but i think for many people this is an opportunity to do some reflection to do some thinking on how are we living our lives i know for myself this has been a time with more space, like maybe not as busy in every way as, as every days are, gives more time to think. And I think it's very important, allow yourself to think, to reflect on 
the way you're living, how do you want to live, what do you want your life to look like into the future, work on your lifestyle habits, uh, also your mental health habits, your spiritual habits, your connection with other people. Uh, I think this is, someone said, like, never let a crisis go to waste. Uh, and uh, I think there's, there's some wisdom in that. Uh, a crisis can be a turning point actually into something better if we make good use of it, even though the best thing would have been that we would not be in the situation that we are now. I want to uh, share with you again, like from the Bible, examples of people, um, and this, this case, Apostle Paul, which I think he showed very good mental and spiritual resilience, but also he was very honest about the challenges. In his uh, letter to the church in the Corinth, uh, the second letter, he writes about what kind of stress he, they experienced, he and his, his fellow missionaries. He said, for we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia, uh, for we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. I don't know if, if you've read your Bible, if you've ever noticed this text, I really sort of noticed and it really registered with me recently. Like Paul, the apostle called by God, do, doing ministry, mission, a missionary, he said he was so burdened, he didn't have, like, beyond his own strength that he and his fellow missionaries, they despaired of life itself. I don't know, sort of, um, if you've ever been that stressed and stretched in your own life anytime that you despaired of life itself, that to me, this, this sounds quite like a depression that, that he was in. But the fortunate thing, he was able to bounce back. Uh, if we go a few chapters later in chapter four, I think he there shows a very good perspective and attitude uh, on how to deal with things, what perspective to have in, in a crisis. He says, we are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed but not in despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. So what, what he is, what, what, what I think is very good and where Paul is an example to us is that he acknowledges that this is difficult. He doesn't say, well, well, everything is good, praise God. Everything will turn out well. Well, he maybe has the hope that things are going to turn out well, but in this very moment, Paul acknowledged that this is tough, this is rough, what we are going through. But he doesn't give up because he said, all is not lost. It's not only hard. We are not crushed. We are not in despair. We are not forsaken. And I think that part is so important whenever we go through difficult things. Paul, he puts his trust in God and he is supported by other people also in this, this situation. We are struck down, but we're not destroyed. All is not lost. Uh, and I think this is a perspective and, and a, uh, attitude to take into whatever crisis we face, to acknowledge what is difficult, but not only see what is difficult, see what still remains that is good and positive and where there is hope. Um, how do we deal with living in this broken world? that we're living in? How do we cope with that? Um, and I, for the remainder of the talk, I would like to share just some perspectives, some attitudes, mindsets um, that, that, that I think can be helpful to, to have in this situation. Um, and the first one is contentment, or we could say happiness, or we could say peace is the gap between reality and expectations. Um, like if you just think about that for a while, we all are dealing with a reality. We cannot change reality. We can change our perception of reality, 
to, to some extent, but reality is what it is. And the best thing we can do is to deal with it as it is. The challenge sometimes is can be our expectations. If we enter into a life and think everything is going to be easy, uh, then we are bound to be frustrated, disappointed, and we're going to struggle. Uh, or if we say everything is going to work out perfectly, uh, I'm not going to have any problems in life, then there's a huge gap between the reality uh, that we are facing and unrealistic expectations. When we're able to have a good match between the reality as it is and we're having realistic expectations, that's when we are best equipped to deal with uh, life as it is, as it will come to us and not despair um, too easily. I think Jesus, again, uh, he says, in the world, you will have tribulations. That is the expectations. This is how, as we go about life in this world, acknowledge we will have tribulations. We are in the midst of a pandemic. It's not the first pandemic. There's been many pandemics in the history of this world. Uh, and there will be more after this one um, also. But that is a reality. But then what Jesus said, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So don't give up, don't despair. There's more to reality than the tribulations. And hold on to that. Hold on to that. Uh, more the good, good things. Then what can be even more difficult sometimes is how do we deal with our broken selves? Ourselves, which we acknowledge or must acknowledge if we are realistic, that we are not perfect. We are struggling at times. And I would like to propose again another perspective. And this is like true wholeness and well being can only be had when we accept our brokenness, but we don't, cannot stop there. We need, if we're going to have wholeness and well-being in life, we need to accept our brokenness, but we don't stop there. On, in addition to that, we need to receive the gift of grace from someone who loves us. I think that is essential if we're going to do well and cope well with life in this world and ourselves. Acknowledge that we are limited, we are broken, we fail, but we need to match that with grace from someone, from God, from Jesus, uh, and from other people. I think that is the only way to have wholeness and true well-being. And for those of you who are into math, I put this up as, as um, an equation with, with where it's a multiplication. That means if one of these is zero, then the, the whole, the sum is zero of, of, of this. Um, if we don't accept our brokenness, we cannot have true wholeness and well-being. That, because that is the reality of, of who we are. But if there is no grace, then we would despair in the midst of our brokenness. And I would, I like this imagery that in a way, uh, grace is the glue that can glue our broken pieces together and make us whole again. And that this grace is something that we need from someone else. It's not something we can give to ourselves. It comes to us from, from the outside. Um, again, and this is from Jesus. Uh, he's saying to Paul, Paul, he had his brokenness. He struggled with his things. Uh, he had this, this is in the context where he's talking about the thorn in the flesh that uh, Paul uh, was struggling with. But Jesus told him, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Uh, and I think this is so important to hold on to. The grace that God gives us, it, it's sufficient for us. It can glue our broken pieces together. And, and um, that way, his strength is what is, makes us whole. Um, again, this is in Romans, Paul saying, but where sin abounded, 
grace abounded so much more. I think this is so important, also not just in our relationship with God, but this is what we need in our relationships to one another. Also that there is grace in our relationships when we fail, when we do wrong things, when we are not what we should be, because that's a reality for all of us. There is no perfect human being in this world. Um, and I'm one of those who are not perfect. Uh, but what we need is the grace. That's the only way we can cope and continue to go on and have, have hope and have courage to face, face tomorrow. In Hebrews, another beautiful text is, says, for we do not have a high priest that is Jesus, who is unable to sympathize with us in our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. And I would just sort of pause for a second because sometimes if we read this text, we, we get focused on the last part, yet without sin. And then some will say, well, because Jesus is our example and he lived life without sin, then we should live life without sin. But that is not the message of this text. The message is the next verse, verse 16. Because Jesus, the high priest, sympathizes with our weakness because he cares about us because he understands he doesn't reject us because of our weaknesses because of that let us with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need and this is what this time of need that's pretty much every day that's pretty much every day for for all of us and we can approach him with confidence because of this. Um, another perspective connected to this is that the grace we're able to receive is proportionate to the acknowledgement and acceptance of our brokenness. If we don't acknowledge and accept our brokenness, then we won't have any desire for grace because we will think we are okay, we are perfect. A uh, great example is Jesus in, together with Simon uh, and with Mary and in this party that, that Simon had for with them, where Mary came and anointed Jesus. And, and Jesus said, I tell you her sins, he talked about Mary and they are many. But that's a reality, but there's no accusations, there's no criticism in this. Her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven, so she has shown me much love. When we have been shown grace, when we have been forgiven, uh, and we have received it, that's when we can truly love also. But a person who is Forgiven little shows only little love. Another story, a, a parable that Jesus told, but the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, the other was a Pharisee that did not think that he had any problems. I tell you this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. Perspective three, the goodness of life, it's measured in the quality of our relationships. And that's in this whole COVID thing that we are in the midst. That's why it's so important also to stay connected with other people. In the end, what really matters in life is our connection and the quality of our relationships with other people and with, with God. There is no good life without good relationships. And that's why the Bible is so focused on, on this. And the last perspective that I want to share is that in the end, what really matters is not what we are or who we are, but whose we are, who do we belong to. That's what really gives mental resilience. That is what gives spiritual resilience that's what gives us ability to, to go through life. 
And I would just close with, with a poem written by one of my, my favorite authors, uh, his theologian. He's not Adventist, but he writes very good things. Um, and Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he was uh, a German uh, in, during the Second World War. He opposed Hitler and the Nazi regime. And in the end, he was executed a few days before uh, the war ended because of his opposition. But he was a theologian and a deeply spiritual man. And I want to share with you a poem that he wrote in 1944 when he was sitting in a Gestapo prison in, in Berlin. And it's this again, who am I, whose am I? Uh, and I think he expresses that so well. And also this conflict, these struggles that he was having. Who am I? They often tell me I would step from my cell's confinement calmly, cheerfully, firmly, like a squire to his country house. That was he looked like to the outside, on the outside. Who am I? They often tell me I would talk to my warders freely and friendly and clearly as though it were mine to command. Who am I? They also tell me I would bear the days of misfortune equably, smilingly, proudly, like one accustomed to win. Like on the outside, he looked like he was quite sovereign. He would look like he was doing very well, that he was coping well with these things. But then this is his self-reflection. This is what now he opens up to show what does it did it feel like on the inside. Am I then really all that which other men tell of? Or am I only what I know of myself, restless, longing and sick, like a bird in a cage, struggling for breath, as though hands were compressing my throat, yearning for colors, for flowers, for the voices of birds, thirsting for words of kindness, for neighborliness, trembling with anger at despotisms and petty humiliation, tossing in expectations of great events, powerlessly trembling for friends at an infinite distance, weary and empty at praying, at thinking, at making, faint and ready to say farewell to it all. This great spiritual man, theologian, this was still what he could feel like on the inside, frustrated, in pain, struggling. Who am I, this or the other? Am I one person today and tomorrow another? Am I both at once a hypocrite before others and before myself a contemptible, woebegone weakling? Or is something within me still like a beaten army fleeing in disorder from victory already achieved? And then conclusion to his poem, which I like so much. Who am I? They mock me these lonely questions of mine. And then he said, whoever I am, thou knowest, O oh God, I am thine. Whoever I am, who, whatever I feel like, however I assess myself, thou knowest, O oh God, I am thine. He belongs to God. That's what gives him the power to go, go on. And this is mirrored in this beautiful Bible text. But now, thus says the Lord who created your Jacob, he who formed your Israel, fear not. For I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. So that's what I think I would like to leave you with. Uh, uh, today, this in the end, what really matters, uh, what gives us resilience, mental resilience, is that we deal with the challenges we are facing, um, that we don't run away from it, that we, but also that we hold on to other people, that we know who we belong to, and that we know. Uh, that we belong to God and he holds us in our hands, whatever our circumstances is. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Torben. That is a timely presentation or timely message indeed at this time of this 
pandemic, um, we really appreciate your presentation. I noticed that uh, in the Q&A, there is one question. Um, perhaps there may be other questions, but uh, we will spend probably a couple of minutes to I'm sorry, I did not uh, announce uh, before this that you, you can write your question and answer. But there is one that has been uh, put here. I think it is from Bangladesh. I am a mental health depression and could not sleep properly. How do I relieve myself from it? I of an international mission school, a question from Bangladesh. Shall I just Perhaps, share some uh, thoughts on? Sure, sure. And um, what what I think is is very important is like to acknowledge that, like if um, say if if you get like uh, infected by this coronavirus. Uh, and you get sick, then most of us, we would seek professional help for, for that. Uh, when we're dealing with physical health issues, most of us, we are very, we understand, and there's not, there's no shame in, in seeking professional help for that. The same thing applies with many places, people are very reluctant to seek professional help for that. And that's, that would be my like first advice always. If you are struggling with something in the way you are feeling, in the way you are thinking, um, in like an example like this, depression um, and sleep problems, then I would strongly urge like to seek a doctor uh, or a mental health professional and talk about it because there is so there are many things that can be done mental health issues is not something you should just wait and see if it passes if it goes away um, because it impacts quality of life it impacts your ability to function and and worst case is that that uh untreated mental health illness can be ultimately fatal. Also, it can lead to people having suicidal thoughts, giving up on life, and the whole thinking becomes distorted. So you're not able anymore to reason um, and, and deal with reality as it, it, you should. So that is, is the first advice. Uh, and I think I would maybe uh, leave it with that advice for, for now also, is that, that whenever, whenever someone is struggling with something, whether yourself, your family, someone you know, if you're a health professional uh, and you realize that this person is struggling, then make sure they get to talk with someone who is qualified to deal with those, those problems. There are many things that we uh, beyond that can do uh, also like healthy lifestyle, uh, keeping a regular sleep rhythm, uh, trying to do that. Don't use screens late at night. Uh, those things are very important. Having a, a healthy diet, exercising, making sure you're physically active. Like if you're struggling with sleep issues, rule number one is exercise uh, mm -hmm. because it will help you become physically tired so your body can rest. I, I know that for myself, just these uh, times with being isolated at home, if there's been a couple of days where I have not been able to exercise, I can feel it in so many ways. It's not good for me. Uh, so again, encourage strongly exercise but um, and then also talk with someone if you have a mental health issues talk with someone uh, a, a sensible person that you trust 
um, that, that you can share what's going on. Don't struggle with mental health issues alone in isolation. Make sure you connect with other people, with friends, with family, uh, with a pastor, uh, whoever it is. And then also make sure there are health professionals that, that uh, you uh, talk, talk to. Thank you very much. Uh, there is one more question, doctor, or maybe two more. We will probably have time for this two more. Um, I always have nightmares and there's no particular time to occur. It could be the time or night time. What could be the possible? Um, like the, the question is that someone's struggling with night. I was breaking up a bit, so I didn't quite hear, but someone's struggling with nightmares and what, what, what the cause is for that. Was, was that the question? Yes, yes, I think so. Yeah. Well, um, like nightmares, there, there can be many sort of causes for that. It depends, again, sort of what I would say. This is something, if, if it really something that is happens repeatedly, consistently, then that's some, again something that probably needs professional attention uh, to that. Um, uh, some people they can like some people have a more active dream life other other people uh, don't dream so much if if there are bad things that have happened in the past like some kind of trauma that can also play a role in that it sort of comes up in night times also so that that's sort of again it needs a holistic assessment by a health professional um, and I, it's, I, I can't provide that uh, in this, this uh, and it would not be the right place for that. But, but uh, again, I, my recommendation would be like to talk with someone uh, if someone is available. Um, and, and also again, like talking with someone sharing with a friend's family about what's going on, also trying to, 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 to work on it that way. That can also be a good thing. You can talk about it. Maybe it will come up less during the nighttime. Thank you very much. Uh, there's one more question. Maybe we still have time on this. Um, I want to ask question regarding resilience, overcoming our time's need to have uh, this thing, but really, Reality suggests we need to reach out for someone or something. How to sing in or achieve with the reality of our times? Perhaps one or two minutes for this question. Are you able to summarize the question so I can? Yeah. I didn't quite get it. I'm sorry. If you can. Uh, uh, Click on the Q and A. You will see the question oh, here. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, it's from George Cloudy. I'm not quite sure I understand the the, the question. Uh, so. Um, but I, again, like if, if I say like what what said here that like to reach out to someone or something, um, I think that that is a major resilience factor uh, mm -hmm. in that that we stay connected with with others, uh, whether that's our people or or God. So. Uh, but I am. I don't know if that was a good question or, or answer to to the question. I'm sorry if I don't quite uh, able to like catch what the essence of, of the question is. Anyway, thank you, doctor. I think you said something that is relevant. Uh, let's look at one more question, and uh, we will end this. Uh, this is from. Uh, 
Yen Rico Michael Sitang. Many times I am driven to help those who are depressed or stressed by this situation. But most of the times they don't want to open up their problems or struggle. Of course, I'm praying for them, but is there any tips to make people open up their hearts and gain their trust so that they would talk to me and say their struggle? Well, that, that's that. It, it's, it's a great question, and it is one of the challenges that we we often face when we're dealing with mental health issues. Uh, one thing is many people feel ashamed that they are struggling, and that's what I want to. A very important message that we need all to communicate to one another that it's okay to struggle mentally. Just that we are become sick physically, we become we struggle mentally. That's part of life in this world. It's unavoidable. Um, like in this very moment, a huge number of people in this world have a mental illness, but you would never know it because many don't tell anyone, they don't tell about their struggle, they suffer in, 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 in silence. What, what, so like to overcome the shame and also the self-criticism and what some people may have is kind of guilt, like why am I feeling like this? There must be something wrong with me since I'm feeling like this. Uh, and that's what we need to overcome. The thing, what we need often, like it, it takes time and to say, to approach people gently. With, with this, if people don't want to open up, you can't force them and you shouldn't force them. That's not a good thing. But to, to check in with them frequently, tell them, I am worried. I worry that you're struggling with something. I see these things and that this makes me wonder how you're doing. Do it in an empathetic way, uh, being kind, being gentle with the person uh, being understanding. And as, as the key thing is how do you gain the trust so they're willing to open up and show their vulnerability? This is something that takes time. So this, this building a relationship and in that building trust, that is essential, but be persistent, not overly pushy on it. But, but come back to the person, check in with them and again and again and tell them, like, I'm here for you. If you ever want to talk about these things, I, you can talk with me. I want to support you. I want to help you. Giving them that kind of supportive, positive messages, I think is very important and do it repeatedly. Um, then maybe at some point they will say, okay, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll come uh, and, and make use of this, this offer that was given to me and talk. Thank you, Doc. Um, there are several more questions. I will another platform for you to answer this. But um, right now, we would like to show you an appreciation. If if the certificate of appreciation can be shown right now. We yeah, are Dr. Torben, we really appreciate your presentation this morning. Because you have uh, served the Lord in, in these territories to, in Southern Asia Pacific Division. Um, if uh, this can be enlarged, uh, thank you. Yeah, a little bit more, please. Mm. All right, thank you. Um, <clears throat> because you have served the Lord in his, in, in his territory here in Southern Asia Pacific Division, through the faithful exercise of your precious gifts of giving the keynote message to the participants of the health webinar, entitled Scaling Up Comprehensive Health Ministry. And because the body of Christ in this part of the world had been enriched by your faithfulness, we award this certificate of appreciation to you, Dr. Torben Berlin, 
given this 17th day of June in the year of the Lord, I am uh, in the year of the Lord 2020. It's signed by the president of the division, Michael Samuel Saw, the, uh, the executive secretary, uh, Pastor Rudy Bo Boloyo, and also signed by the treasurer, uh, Dr. Max Langi, and uh, of course, signed by Dr. Lalaine Alfonso, <coughs> the health director of SSD. Again, thank you, Dr. Tom. Torben, for your time with us this morning. And thank you. It was a privilege to be with you and uh, blessings as you continue the seminar today. I'm, I'm going to go and sleep now, uh, but uh, you have still a day ahead of you and I pray that you will be blessed. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much, you, Dr. Dr. Give a round of applause, Dr. Dr. Torben. Thank you so much from Bangladesh. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Dr. Dr. Thank you so much. From God Southern bless you. Pacific Division. Thank you from Indonesia. Thank you again, Dr. Torben. We will Torben. allow him to go sleep now. We will allow him to go and sleep now. Yeah. <laughs> God bless you. We will have three minutes break and uh, please come back. Three minutes break, three minutes. Ten minutes. <laughs> so, okay. Hello. 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 Connie's, uh, you forgot to tell them that uh, the questions that are not answered will be sent to Dr. Torben and we will request him to answer it and then we will send the answers to them. Okay. Yeah, so I, I mentioned you... it. I, I, I mentioned it, Doc. Yeah. Okay. So for 10 minutes while we are stretching, we will hear music from Jessica. No sound. Jess. Yes, yes. Yeah, I just... Like clockwork, every November, a spectacular journey comes to an end as millions of monarch butterflies travel thousands of miles to reach this patch of forest in the Sierra Madre Mountains of central Mexico. Here, they will spend the winter safe from the freezing temperatures where they were born. This transcontinental migration began three months earlier when a new generation of monarchs emerged east of the Rocky Mountains from Canada to Texas. Then by late September, most of them departed for an overwintering site they had never seen before. Their roots have funneled the butterflies through the Midwestern United States. Traveling more than 50 miles a day, they navigated precisely with their solar and magnetic compasses and internal clock. These insects have no leader to follow or prior knowledge of their destination. Yet every year, another generation finds sanctuary by clustering on the same trees that sheltered their great-great-grandparents the year before. In many ways, the monarch's epic journey is still a mystery to science, and questions of how are not satisfied by theories based on blind chance or random genetic mutations. Instead, within this finely tuned environment, 8,000 feet above sea level, evidence of biological design, foresight, 
and purpose is displayed with each magnificent stroke of every paper-thin wing. Ma'am, kayo na pong sunod. Okay po. Ah, uh, uh, kami po ang mag-share. Sige po. Okay. Hello? Morning. Hello? Hello? Microphone. Hello? Hello, good morning. Audio test, check, testing. Audio testing. Microphone testing, check. Good morning. Chaplain Appa. May sisiyan pa siya. Ako na ang next. 
Pastor, Pastor Connie, it, I think it's time to introduce the speaker. All right, uh, welcome back to everyone. Um, our next speaker is uh, a lady speaker. Again, I have not uh, met her before, but um, she must be a very, very knowledgeable person, I'm sure. Uh, Wendelin G. Baluis. Um, let me just read her CV for us. Uh, Wendelin G. Baluis is a registered nurse and uh, she has a master's degree in uh, nutrition, I think. A knowledgeable and enthusiastic registered nurse, master in uh, nursing, sorry, master in nursing with hands on experiences in the field of public health services. Wendy, to her colleagues and friends, had been uh, a dynamic or has been a dynamic public health servant for the last 28 years. Previously, she worked at the Philippine, uh, Philippine Red Cross Society and uh, International Committee of the Red Cross, OIICRC, as medical uh, field coordinator on humanit humanitarian missions with her recognized work. And that was, she was a part-time professor at the College of uh, the Colleges of Nursing, handling uh, research and con community health nursing. She worked at uh, the DOH Global Fund HIV six project 
as program assistant where she provides technical assistance, capacity building, resources assistance, policy and system development, monitoring and evaluation. Today, she is the regional program manager of the following health uh, programs at the Department of Health Center for Health Development, BICOL, Mental Health Program, Non-Communicable Diseases Prevention and Control, National Voluntary Blood Services Program. Her task focuses on the provisions of uh, capacity building and uh, advocacy development resources, assistance, policy and system development and monitoring and evaluation. If you may be patient a little bit, uh, she received national award and uh, citations on as the outstanding blood donor uh, recruitment officer voluntary blood services program. She's an outstanding alumna in Bicol from Bicol University College of Nursing in 2019. She's an outstanding alumna we call a university during the uh, 50th founding uh, anniversary, 2019. One of the contributors to the development of national uh, learning uh, materials in uh, voluntary board uh, blood donation in elementary, secondary, and uh, alternative learning system. She's an author of one of the best theses, the advocacy program of the blood regional blood center, an assessment in uh, 2005, masters in uh, nursing be called university. She is a catalyst for the establishment of the regional mental health council in Bicol region. And yet uh, we have a few more which I would really want to read. She is a dynamic health advocates or sustain institutionalized regional mental health congresses in Bicol region. She established the, the service delivery network on mental community health delivery system. She received various citations of appreciation yeah, appreciations and commendations as resource person in the implementation of the aforementioned health programs. She's a trainer, service provider on the following health programs, mental health, national voluntary blood services, and non or non-communicable disease, diseases prevention and control. Dr. Windelin, we are most glad to have you with us during this time. May I give you the time now. Mom, kindly unmute. Oh. 
We can hear you. Mom, we can't hear you. Mom Wendy. Uh, pwede po alisin yung headphone. Then, bunutin po yung ano. Let's check it. Can you can you speak, ma'am? Wala. Mute. Mute. Hello, good morning. Yeah. Good morning. Okay. So good morning so much. Can I can I again uh, try to uh, to connect my audio? Okay. Okay. Okay na po? Yes po. Okay, finally. Thanks, God. Hello, good morning to everyone. Uh, first, I would like to thank Ma'am Lalaine and the rest of the uh, Seventh-day Adventist uh, family for inviting me to share with you what we have in Bicol region, especially in establishing our mental health in general, specifically to the mental health in the workplace. So I was actually requested to talk about the mental health uh, in the workplace, the policies and guidelines, and I hope our participants will be able to listen carefully because we are so excited to share with you all what we had in Bicol region. So let's start about the ABC in the in the mental health. We want to, yeah. Okay. So next slide, please. Okay. Again, uh, I'm, I'm Wendy. Just call me Wendy for short. Next slide, please. Okay. So let us uh, define first what uh, health is all about. So based on the WHO definition, a health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of diseases or infirmity. So in on one hand, Ma'am Lalaine, can we make a request that the speaker will just put his her slide in not in a presenter presenter's mode so that it will become bigger on the screen for us. Just duplicate. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Po. Okay. So let us continue. I can't. I can't see my presentation actually. There's a problem. Okay. So can can we please uh, put it on a full uh, full view, please? Okay. So okay, na po. Okay na po, okay na, okay na. Okay na po ba? Okay, so I was actually requested the organizer to uh, present my slides. Okay, so thank you. Thank you so much for that. Thank you so much for uh, sharing my uh, presentation. So let us now continue uh, to our topic, mental health in the workplace, specifically uh, talking about the policies and guidelines. Next slide. As I mentioned a while ago, Okay, thank you. As I mentioned a while ago, so let's now uh, define the, the health first. Now, before we proceed to what, uh, uh, let us proceed to what uh, the WHO defined about health. So health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of diseases or infirmity. So on one hand, a healthy workplace is defined as one in which workers and managers collaborate to use a uh, continual improvement uh, process to protect and promote the health and safety and well-being of all the workers and sustainability of the workplace. Okay, so next slide, please. Uh, in fact, uh, there were uh, identified needs no, in our World Health Organization based on our World Health uh, Organization in terms of promoting the work 
a healthy workplace. As such, uh, the needs are uh, categorized into uh, four. And number one is uh, health and safety concern in terms of the physical work environment. So in the physical work environment, we are referring to uh, the physical structure, the air, machinery, the furniture. Uh, I think, uh, are, can can I uh, check from our participant if you are if you are looking at I mean the presentation is in full view. May I may I check please? Can you please uh, uh put the yes please in our chat uh, box? It's not on a full view, ma'am. Ah okay. In so our, uh, it's a presentation's view. Presenter's okay. View. So it has to be in in a uh, full view. Yes, ma'am. Okay, Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah, I noticed that. So I think uh, I will just be uh, sharing my screen. Yeah. yeah. That's okay. Is it okay? Uh, please bear with us for this uh, technical uh, problem. Yeah. Okay, na po. Think, okay, na po. okay na po ba? Okay. Yeah. So I observed that it, uh, we are uh, giving a very, very small no, phone to our participants and I'm afraid that they will would not be able to follow. No? So thank you so much for our organizers. So to continue, so we're talking about the identified needs no, in terms of how we would like to promote the, uh, the uh, healthy, uh, work, uh, healthy uh, lifestyle in our workplace. In fact, as I mentioned a while ago, there are four identified needs. And we need to look at it in, in one factor uh, that is specifically on the physical work environment. So we need to have a safety, safety factors in our physical work environment. And that includes, as I've said, uh, we're talking about the air, can be uh, through um, air conditioning, air condition or fan. So we need to ensure that it is, we are providing uh, a clean air to our employees. No? And aside from that, uh, we need also to, to check the furnitures, the, the chairs. No? It should be uh, an ergonomic so that our employees would not be able to sit no? uh, to uh, uh, experience a lot of discomfort no? while while sitting. So those are the example on the physical work environment. Now on the second need, so we need to ensure that health and safety and well-being concerns in the psychosocial work environment. So why psychosocial work environment? Because we want to ensure that organiza organizational culture like attitudes, the values, the beliefs of our employees, as well as the daily practices should be uh, in place in the workplace as well. So the third need identified is actually the personal resources in the workplace. So what are the exa examples of the personal resources in the workplace? So it refers to the health services. So in fact, uh, in the Department of Health, we have a lot of uh, we have a lot of uh, practices that we need to establish. Like, for example, the uh, the opportunities, the trainings, and uh, we need supportive. Uh, environment to to make sure that all the employees would be able to connect with the working uh, environment. So, yun po no, yung mga examples of personal resources in the workplace. And the last one, the last identified need uh, is the ways in uh, participating in the community to improve the health workers. So, that includes our families and work members of the communities. Okay, so next slide, please. Okay. Next slide. Now, in in uh, in the next slide, uh, this slide is giving us a picture in a nutshell about pressing the need for reliable data. At this point in time, there are limitations in terms of conducting researches on uh, mental and neurological uh, substance use. Uh, in fact, there are four, uh, four uh, researches or data, uh, namely 60% uh, of atten attending primary health clinics daily are estimated to have one or more mental, neurological, and substance use. So aside from that, we have also elicited from another data that 33% of adults and 66% of children 
are diagnosed with epilepsy at the uh, Philippine General Hospital Outpatient uh, Department. Uh, another one is 16% of students uh, between 13 to 15 uh, years old uh, uh, were seriously uh, thought of uh, suicide. So uh, this is the, the alarming because uh, the Department of Health had also a uh, survey or research about about the government employees who have uh, uh, 32 percent of experiencing from mental health problems and that was in 2006. So this data uh, shows us that mental health uh, services is really significant to be provided not only in the general population but also or specifically in the workplace. Okay. And uh, next slide please. Okay. Next slide, please. Next slide. Okay. So, based from those pressing uh, needs, uh, we would like to associate those with this uh, work-related risk factor for health. Number one is inadequate health and safety policies. So in inadequacy of safety policies would actually uh, prone to uh, prone to risk, especially on accidents or any related uh, diseases. For example, yung mga uh, yung uh, mga accident no, due to uh, wet floors and uh, uh, unsafety uh, physical environment. No? The, the second risk also refers to poor communication and uh, management uh, practices. Okay? And uh, the third one is the limited participation in decision making or low control of one's area of work and uh, including the low level of support for employees. So those are associated to our work-related risk factor for health, especially in inflexible working hours, especially at this point in time no, uh, during the COVID crisis. So we need to consider some flexible working hours just to give wellness in our workplace. And uh, last, of course, we need to, to have a clear task or organizational objectives. So those are the work-related risk factors for health. Okay. So next slide, please. Now, uh, to, address all the, to address all the gaps on mental health, specifically in the workplace, policies and guidelines were developed at the national down to the local levels. And that includes at the national levels, we have the National Mental Health Facility, if you can see on your uh, white screen, that was actually developed in 2001 through the Administrative uh, Order Number 8. And uh, uh, it was uh, uh, based on the National Mental Health Policy 2001, it was pursued on the mental health strategy, prioritizing the promotion of mental health and the protection of the rights and freedom of persons with mental diseases and reduction of burden and consequences of mental ill health, including the mental and brain disorders and disabilities. So that is uh, uh, indicated in the National Mental Health Policy in uh, AO number 8. Now the next uh, policy, Department of Health Policy, is the operational framework for the sustainable establishment of mental health program uh, administrative order 009 2007 so that goals actually uh, directing to reduce the mental health uh, prevalence reducing the mortality from suicide and intentional harm uh, including reduction of the risk of mental disorder through a promotion of mental health in the general population and improvement in the quality of life for those suffering from such condition. So it also includes the four priority of sub-components. 
on that uh, second uh, policy, namely young health and wellness, and then the extreme life experience, and then also the, some program on the, the drugs and the mental and neurological. So those are the some components of the mental health program under the operational framework for the sustainable establishment of mental health program. And finally, it was in a 2018 when the Republic Act 11036 was uh, passed. And from that 11036, known uh, otherwise as the National Mental Health Act, uh, the, the Philippine Health, uh, the Philippine Council for Mental Health uh, developed the National Mental Health Strategic Framework for year 2019 to 2013. Yan po yung kanilang achieved. Now, uh, in June 20, as I said, uh, the Philippine Mental Health Law was uh, was passed, and uh, that act, the Republic Act 11036, is an act establishing a proto a national mental health policy for the purpose of enhancing the delivery of integrated uh, mental health services promoting and uh, protecting the rights of persons utilizing psychiatric, the neurologic, and psychological health services, and uh, including the appropriation of funds for all mental health services. Okay, so next slide. So we would like to share with you what uh, the, the Philippine, uh, the Philippine uh, Council for Mental Health uh, developed no, ito po yung uh, National Mental Health Strategic uh, Framework where the Philippine Council for Mel Mental Health is guided by the objective set forth by the Republic Act uh, 11036 or also known as the Mental Health Act. So the objectives include strengthening the effective leadership and governance for mental health. And uh, another objective set uh, by the by the council through this national mental health strategic framework is to develop and establish a comprehensive, integrated, effective, and efficient national mental health care system, and uh, including the researches and mental health and uh, integrate the mental health care uh, in the basic health uh, services. So this is actually the direction of the National Mental Health Strategic Framework through the guidance or uh, uh, direction of the Philippine Council. Okay, next slide. Now, uh, the, partly, the National Mental, uh, Mental Health Strategic Framework uh, developed uh, through the Republic Act 11036. It was uh, indicated therein in chapter 5 in section chapter 5 uh, section 26 the promotion of mental health in the workplace uh, in chapter 5 it was uh, stressed out that all employees shall develop appropriate policies and programs on mental health in the workplace which are designed to number one raise awareness on mental health issues Correct the stigma and discrimination. Identify and provide support for individual at risk. And of course, facilitate access of individuals with mental health condition to treatment and psychosocial support. So those are the provisions uh, stress, stress out in Chapter 5 of Section 26 of Republic Act 11036. Okay. So in same act, the Republic Act 11036, the duties and responsibilities of the key uh, implementers like the Department of Health no, uh, was also indicated. The Department of Health was uh, mandated in, chapter, in the Republic Act to provide support services for families and co-workers of service users, mental health professionals, workers, and other services. And also the Department of uh, uh, Labor and Employment together with the Civil Service Commission in coordination with the Department of Health uh, mandated to develop guidelines and standards on appropriate and evidence-based mental health programs for the workplace. 
and also to develop policies that promote mental health in the workplace and address stigma and discrimination, especially uh, from the service users, no? uh, given with mental, uh, suffering from mental health conditions. Okay. In uh, the good news, the Department of uh, Labor and Employment, or DOLE, uh, they already developed the guidelines you know, for the implementation of mental health workplace and policies you know, together with uh, the institutionalization of programs for the private sector. So take note for the private sectors. While, uh, next slide please, while the Civil Service Commission under the provision section 36, they developed the guidelines on the mental health program in the public sector. So that means that Civil Service Commission uh, is also mandated you know, to provide uh, policies and protocols on the mental health program for the government uh, organizations. Okay. So, okay. so what about the Department of Health? No? Uh, as based on the Department of Health Section 1, so it was actually stated in the, in the Republic Act 11036 that uh, mental health in the workplace should also be established at the regional uh, down to the local level. So the guidelines should be, uh, the, the law should uh, 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 adhere in uh, institutionali institutionalizing mental health through, uh, through the workplace. In fact, the Department of Health Regional Office uh, developed uh, this uh, guideline. So, uh, ang title po niya ay yung uh, uh, workplace uh, guidelines for the institutionalization of mental health in the workplace through assessment and management of fatigue. Okay. Now, in this slide, the next slide shows that uh, uh, mental health in the workplace can be done through that uh, flowchart, so assessment and management of fatigue. So we would like to thank our uh, psychiatrists in Bicol region because they are very, very helpful in crafting these policies. No special mention to Dr. OJ Pandes and Dr. Morico. We have finally you know, crafted uh, this uh, policy that would be uh, that will uh, give us guidance no, in, in, in providing uh, assessment and management of fatigue for our employees. Now, if you will see in our slide, there are five steps in assessment, in assessing and managing our our uh, employees. Now, one is uh, uh, all employees you know, shall uh, undergo screening for fatigue in the workplace. In the workplace, are uh, using the Maslach uh, burn uh, burnout uh, inventory. So that should be done every six months to ensure that. Uh, all employees uh, must undergo inventory of the behaviors and their reactions to prevent from this uh, fatigue. So this is the this is actually the tool that we are using in assessing and management of fatigue. Now after after assessing all identified employees uh, having a result of moderate to high level of burnout shall undergo screening for depression and anxiety. So again, uh, we are using another tool, namely the Zoom uh, Depression and Anxiety Self-Rating Scale. So we have two tools again. Then uh, after using these two tools and knowing that the employees are suffering from major depressive disorder or anxiety disorder, so that would be the time that we would like to recommend our employees to our psychiatrist. No? If yes, if the major depression uh, disorder is... Um, uh, uh, man, uh, assess, then of course uh, we will recommend them, re recommend our uh, employees to the psychiatrist. Now, if the evaluation uh, is no, I mean, uh, the uh, depression is not. Uh, 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 it's not the result not during the uh, it's not. Uh, uh, it's not uh, noted uh, during the it's not noted during the screening, so it, it should be uh, referred to our uh, psych psychologist. Now, how can we advise our employees to uh, to go back to 
the to their workplace so that was that will be upon the recommendation of course of our psychiatrist and psychologist so of course upon the submission to work uh, the uh, recommendation through uh, through a, um, a medical uh, certificate uh, will be uh, uh, asked by our by our uh, management by our office so they will be uh, they will be again uh, uh, go back to their workplaces so these are the processes or the flow chart that we have developed in our workplace so that we'll be able to help our employees you know, in terms of assessing and managing our own fatigue okay so next slide so another policy that we develop in at the regional and local we established uh, we established the local usap tayo the hotlines in response to service users you not know, needing psychosocial services if you will see there is a uh, there is a poster on the the left side so that is one of the samples of our a uh, poster that we posted in our duh uh fb fb um website where in uh, we are encouraging all our service users to to reach out the the covid 19 crisis hotline so that we would be able to provide psychosocial services and it was indeed uh, translated again to a policy uh, for a sound uh, direction and uh, information to all our key partners okay next slide please so aside from those uh, policies we also crafted uh, several uh, policies and uh, protocols namely uh, the basic psychosocial skills for the COVID-19 responders, especially the responders from the hospitals and uh, from the local or primary health uh, health facilities, namely the, the rural health units and the city health offices. So they they were also trained on these basic psychosocial skills for COVID-19 responders responders very timely at this uh, uh, this uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic and another uh, guidelines that we crafted also the implementation or establishment of our psychological first aid for also for our responders including the mental health and psychosocial support and services okay so in in the MHPSS we want to build the resilience we want to of course to incorporate the the uh, the mindfulness and preventing burnout and then uh, uh, we also give or provide stress management you now stressing on the self care self care uh, which is integrated in our health and wellness program now in health and wellness program that includes our annual uh, medical and dental checkup including the physical activities and other and other nutrition and physical activities uh, customized physical activities for all the government uh, employees okay so next slide please Okay, you can see the, the samples of our crafted uh, policies and uh, uh, protocols to support the implementation of the mental health program, specifically in the workplace, such as the BICOL uh, mental health program operational framework and functional structure of the BICOL mental health team. So in 2013, we have already established our BICOL mental health uh, council no? uh, even uh, even uh, before the republic act 11036 so this is the good news thanks to god and uh, we also created a provincial mental health psychosocial support and services in people region uh, including the six provinces and four cities in people region so they have also their own uh, mental health and psychosocial support and services Says, that will address the mental health problem at their respective localities and we also provide uh, we also give recognition and uh, motivation to our champions now champions from the local local uh, key partners so that is through the salud bicol no? so one way of lifting their spirits no spirits in uh, helping each other especially at this point in time so we need to acknowledge them so uh, with that we implement this uh, uh, guidelines in recognizing uh, those uh, champions in the mental health okay so next slide so uh, 
of course, to continue support the implementation of the mental health, we give allocation, we allocate psychotropic drugs. And uh, especially among the access sites, we have 114 rural health units, including the health facilities, the hospitals. We provide them with psycho psychotropic drugs from, from the uh, Department of CHD uh, budget. Okay, so that is through the financial support including the support for the establishment of the acute psychiatric unit no since 2017 up to this present we are uh, continuously providing financial support so that they would be able to strengthen strengthen the the implementation of the mental health services at their hospital so those are the support the technical support that we are providing uh, so, uh, in um, in the implementation of the mental health specifically for the mental health of the general population including the mental health in the workplace okay so next slide so to continuously build the healthy community workplace uh, for continual improvement okay next slide we are uh, we would like to aim with our target to have a healthy workplace that can be described as one where workers and managers actively contribute to the working environment by promoting and protecting the health, especially the safety and well-being of all employees. So this is our uh, uh, our uh, goal, no. And with this uh, vision, we continuously would like to identify uh, approaches or interventions so that we would we would be always uh, continuously protect the mental health of our employees by reducing the work-related factors. So th these are the approaches or strategies. No? The three uh, approaches, which is very significant in our implementation. Back up with our uh, practices, healthy lifestyle practices at workplaces. Uh, we'd like to continuously uh, provide fitness uh, facility for the work workers. We have our gym in the department and uh, would like to continuously provide uh, sometimes you know, subsidized healthy food uh, choices and uh, encourage walking and cycling and of course work functions so that uh, there would be a mobility and uh, allow flexibility and timing and let the work breaks to allow exercise so we do a lot of physical activity uh, in between of our uh, work uh, functions and of course uh, we need also to establish a healthy lifestyle through no smoking policies and other uh, and others uh, uh, substance abuses, no? uh, substance use. For example, yung drinking, no, no smoking, and uh, alcohol, bever alcohol beverages, including the drugs. No? So those are the, the best practices that we need to also not only institutionalize in our workplace, but also as an advocate to share this uh, to our key partners or to the general population. And the last, but at the least, is to provide medical services to all our employees. And that is uh, by, by means of the annual medical and dental checkup. Okay, next slide. To continuously uh, to implement our, our mental health in the workplace, we want to, uh, to continuously take the lead, the way in mental health care. So with the support of our management, our regional director now is uh, Dr. Ernie Berra. We are very supportive to, uh, to, uh, to help you know, other key partners, especially for the employees to provide uh, uh, mental health services. Okay. So with that, uh, we are looking uh, that we would be able to look out. You know, please look out for our colleagues, be kinder, and most importantly, uh, take time to look our ourselves and our own mental health. Because, uh, next slide, the wealth of business depends on the health of workers. Okay, so next slide, please. Because there is no health without mental health. So thank you so much for listening. And uh, mabuhay po tayong lahat. 
So we would like also to share with you the sources of information that you can link. Okay? So those are the sources of information. Maraming maraming salamat po sa pakikinig. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Well done. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, thank Mom. You. And may God bless you more. Hey, God bless you po. God bless us all. Great information indeed. Um, thank you. Dr. Mom Wendy, we are yes, very fortunate to have uh, heard and uh, witnessed the information that you have said to us. Not every country has this kind of setup, but to us in the church uh, level, it has given us ideas how to set up uh, our health ministry in, in each mission. Thank you once again. Uh, I, see, I see there are questions for you. If you can just click the question and answer, you will see the the question there. But uh, for the sake of those who may not uh, be in this panel group, uh, there is a question. Uh, how can we make people aware in layman's term when we talk that mental health differs from psychiatric condition? Okay, so it differs actually um, in a layman term, it would be more understandable if we would be able to share with them. So, do, do I need to answer uh, through virtual or just by typing? Yeah, you, you, you may. You may. Okay, thank you so much. So there are uh, different levels of uh, intervention in the, in the Department of Health. Now, what we want is actually to provide uh, mental health for the general population. If you will, see, uh, if you will uh, remember in my previous slides, uh, uh, there's limitation in terms of, in terms of uh, looking at uh, the needs of the general population in terms of uh, the mental health. So very limited, John. But, uh, uh, what we want is actually to provide a promotion of mental health. And uh, promotion of mental health can be given not only in terms of providing the, 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 the psychiatric, I mean the, the, the medicines or psychotropic drug, but it can be done in terms of, in terms of uh, 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 providing mental health in our family. In our uh, in in the workplace, so it's very simple. So we are just by just being uh, kind, by just being compassionate. So we are already providing our mental health. So this is the layman. These are these are the simple intervention that we we need, especially nowadays. Understanding, compassionate, be kind and loving, and this is also true uh, to the sharings uh, given or provided with our previous previous uh, panelists so it's very true that is why this is the the, the, the difference between uh, what are what are the intervention that should be provided from the facilities and what are the interventions that should be provided uh, in the community now the role of the family and the community is very significant and that is by being uh, being uh, uh, compassionate uh, being um, being kind, um, being understanding to know the situation. So these are the factors, motivating factors that will kill a person who is suffering from mental health problem. Okay. Thank you very much. There is still another question here. Does the DOH Bicol region have data regarding the mental health policies, strategies, and support services, and the administration. That is, how many at-risk individuals have been identified? How many of these identified individuals successfully participated in the therapeutic intervention? What were 
what were the precipitating and uh, predisposing factors, etc. Okay, so thank you for thank you so much for that question. At the, at the regional point of view, Department of Health regional point of view, we are actually adhering to the Republic Act 11036. Now, the national uh, had already uh, implemented a lot of policies, and that includes the policies on the operational of the mental health uh, operational of the mental health program. And with that uh, policy, we are abiding and we are trying to uh, to cascade a lot of local uh, policy. And as you uh, as we as I mentioned a while ago, I presented. Uh, a lot of policies in support of the implementation. So that includes the provision of mental health services. So not only at the region, not only from the national, but also the the, the local uh, the local health facilities or the local government have the has a responsibility you know, to to uh, cascade to implement to institutionalize to institutionalize mental health problem so that uh, we would be able to provide mental health services. What are those mental health services? The mental health services include uh, include uh, the psychosocial uh, support. Uh, for example, uh, a while ago, I presented the psychosocial support in terms of psycho psychological first aid, uh, the debriefing, or the or what we call the mindfulness. So these are the basic uh, the basic psychosocial support that we can give. No, but you see, this uh, psychosocial support can also be done by other organizations, and that is by means of collaborative uh, networking of provision, providing the services. At the second, at the second uh, uh, consideration, we are also trying to strengthen our facilities so that um, in case that uh, in case that we are uh, having um, uh, there are referrals for service users uh, about. Uh, I am referring to the chronic, no, chronic uh, patients that they can be referred to the uh, acute psychiatric unit. The acute psychiatric unit uh, was actually uh, are composed of the district hospitals. So we need also to uh, to uh, equip them to provide mental health services, not only the not only the rural health unit, but also but also the hospital so that we'll be able to provide continuous referral system uh, it depends on the condition if a psychiatric condition so that's the time that we can again refer that to the specialist uh, facility now in the in the physical setup of the Bicol region we have the Don Susano Don Susano Rodriguez medical uh, Don Susano Rodriguez uh, mental health uh, facility uh, located in Camarinisul, Naga City. So we're very lucky that we have uh, one specialized facility in Bicol region, wherein we can also refer our chronic patient in case that uh, uh, they need uh, to stabilize and they need to admit the patient in that uh, hos uh, hospital or facility. So that is our form of referral system. Thank you very much. Um, I I want to read one more question. The rest probably will be the question of the rest of the time uh, will be sent uh, later on. But there is a question. I think this is from either Bangladesh or from Pakistan or from uh, Sri Lanka. Is there any facility to provide um, counseling in working areas? At this point in time, uh, we have uh, these concerns were actually was actually uh, uh, hello. Yes. Okay. So at this point in time, we are trying to strengthen to strengthen our uh, our mental services not only uh, with the Department of, of Health, but we are collaborating with the NGOs. A lot of NGOs here, particularly in the Bicol region have the capacity to provide walk-in like we have the holy face facility we have the we have uh, uh, the simon of siren and we have the sisfi so those ngos are one of our parties providing psychosocial and 
back up with our uh, COVID hotline for the psychosocial support. So we are trying to promote this so that uh, we would be able to give remote psychosocial uh, psychosocial support to our service uh, provider who cannot uh, go no, to any facilities to seek uh, help to be provided with psychosocial support. So there are still a lot of considerations or strategies that we need to tackle. No, uh, We understand that uh, at this point in time, we have still gaps in terms of providing uh, these medical mental health services. But the council is very willing and very supportive to help each other to strengthen, to strengthen our mental health services so that we would be able to reach out the the to reach out our service users, especially for the far flung uh, communities, especially at this point in time that we are facing crisis in COVID-19. So the, the one of our key um, key uh, strategies is to uh, engage our partners and listen to them. What are the best uh, what what are the best um, uh, practices that we can also adapt so that we can share that. But uh, for our information, uh, a lot of NGOs and uh, uh, public uh, agency are already uh, providing psychosocial skills. Uh, we, uh, we, we need only uh, to inform them with our uh, right, inf of course, with the right information to direct them to, uh, to the facilities. To the okay. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Um... At this time, we would like to show our appreciation for your time, for your uh, excellent uh, presentation. Thank uh, you so we, much. Yeah. We would like to present Thank this you. certificate of appreciation to you, Ma'am Wendy. Thank you. Um, I would like to read it if this can uh, be adjusted so that it would be larger. Okay, thank you. Uh, certificate of Appreciation. Because you have served the Lord in his territory in the Southern Asia Pacific Division through the faithful exercise of your precious gifts of giving a lecture entitled Workplace Mental Health Protocols and Guidelines to the participants of the health webinar entitled Scaling Up Comprehensive Health Ministry. And because of the body of Christ in this part of the world had been uh, enriched by your faithfulness, we award this certificate of appreciation to you. Um, given this day, 17th of June, in the year of the Lord, 2020. This is signed by the President of uh, Southern Asia Pacific Division, Dr. Samuel So, also signed by uh, Dr. Rudy Bal Baloyo. He is the Executive uh, Secretary of the Southern Asia Pacific Division, also signed by the Treasurer, D Dr. Max Langi, and of course, signed by our director of health in the SSD division, Dr. Rizalen C. Alfonso. Thank you, uh, Thank Mama, you. for your excellent uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Ma'am uh, Nalane. Thank you so much to our S uh, Seventh day Adventist uh, family. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. God bless. Thank you. Back to Dr. Lalin. Okay, hi. I've been talking, but it's I'm with it. So, again, to Mom Wendy, uh, Department of Health in uh, the Bicol region, uh, the reason why uh, we selected them is because we asked the Department of Health, and they are the one leading. They 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 are one of they are the one who is um, implementing. Um, one of the best practices so when it comes to mental health and healthy lifestyle so mom congratulations uh, uh the whole philippines is following your footprints and um, 
we will, would like to follow suit. So again, thank you so much to the Department of Health and to Mamu. Thank Mamo. you. Thank you so much, Bo. Thank you. Okay, ma'am. Uh, okay, so Thank everyone, you. Um, we started early, right? We're supposed to start at 9.30, uh, but we started at 9. That's the reason why we are 30 minutes ahead of time. And because of that, we have more time to enjoy lunch, to enjoy our food uh, during lunchtime. But, uh, virtual lunch, virtual potluck. <laughs> okay, but I again would like to invite each one of you to be back by 2 p.m. Okay, uh, we will open we will open the web platform, the Zoom uh, webinar platform by 1 p.m. But our program will start at 2 p.m. The speaker is uh, Dr. Jan Kabunkal. He will have two lectures, and um, I know that uh, we will uh, receive a lot of information. So again, I would like to invite each one of you to please be back. <coughs> you are all invited to SPUC for lunch. <laughs> we serve special lunch for all of our participants. Oh. That, that is good, Pastor. <laughs> well, we cannot fly over this time. Unmute, poor dog. Well, Marlene, you cannot be here. Okay, now. Nah. <laughs> okay, so um, those of you who have questions, um, we will be sending it again to um, Mom, Mom Wendy. Uh, and some of your questions have been answered by Dr. Torben. If you, if you um, Dr. Alhazana. Dr. Ma'am. Yes, Dr. Bebik. Pastor Bebik. Okay. What happened to Pastor Bebik? He left. Anyway, so thank you again. And let's be back by 2 p.m. Uh, and we'll have Dr. Yan Kabunkal. It will be a, you know, he's a, he's a very dynamic speaker. He's a live wire. And we will receive a lot of information. He's a neuroscientist. And he was talking about, about brain. Um, Pastor Koss, Dr. Connie's. By the way, to our Facebook uh, Facebook viewers, we have a lot of Facebook viewers. We would like to say hi to all of you. Um, to have you, all of you. Um, if you want, you can uh, you can visit our platform, webinar platform, and. Um, you, you can now be, uh, be accommodated, okay? Madam, I'd like to place a request to you. Uh, yes, Pastor Bebik? Uh, I'd like to place a request to you. That is, this subject, mental health, is very, very important. Within this, within this short time, it is not enough for us to catch up the main thing. So... It would be better if you arrange again <laughs> for the mental health. This subject is very important to okay. uh, present again. And it should go a little slow so that we can catch up. Okay. Be better. Very important. Yes. Thank you. Pa Thank you, Pastor Bibek. Pastor Bibek is the president of one of the missions in, in Bangladesh. Yes. So um, we will do that. We, we will do that, Pastor Bibik. In one of uh, these uh, days, we have a lot of webinars coming on. So um, we will take note of that. Thank you so much, uh, Pastor Bibik. And to all of you, um, have, a, have a happy lunch. And we'll see you. We'll see you at 2 p.m. Yes, ma'am. Uh, because if it will, it will be 